Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about my library called Leibniz. It's uh, basically applied propositions as types, right? Is, it, is everyone familiar with the notion? Okay, so the idea is that in logic, you have propositions, right? Like, A or B, or A and B, or A implies B, and so on. There could be some others. Existentials, universal, you know, universal quantification, and so on. Also, you have truths, or like bottom and top. Right? So this is uh, like false, this is true. And propositions as types is this idea that, well, you can take that and you can map it onto lambda terms or, you know, terms in your programming languages. So A or B becomes A either B. A and B becomes a pair of A and B. Um, a implication B becomes A to B. Finally, bottom becomes nothing in Scala. And true is any inhabited type. So for example, unit. Now, notice that here we have something, it's, it's not exactly, it's not an exact mapping, right? Over here we have a unit, right? But we could put anything else like int or string and so I'll talk a little bit about that in, in this talk, why this mapping is not exactly precise, right? And what can we do to remedy that? Okay. Now, a long time ago, somebody showed me this code over here. Specifically, I found it on one of Stephen Compel's blog, blog posts. And what it gives you, now this is a slightly different thing, but the first snippet, if you look at it, how many ways can you write subst? How many ways are there to implement subst? Looks like one. Well, one, but only if A and B are exactly the same, right? Right. We, we know nothing about f, so how can we convert between f of a and f of b? Well, the only way we could possibly produce a value of a type f of b is if we knew that f of a was exactly, uh, if, if a was exactly the same type as b. Right, so the only instance of this type uh, you can only have instances of this type if A is exactly the same type as B, right? But once you're inside, you don't know that they're the same. Yes. However, we can, you know, create a new ref, uh, you know, create a new is of A and A, right? And inside, we know that A uh, and B are the same. We can just, uh, you know, use identity function. Uh, one if uh, types are the same, and zero if, if uh, they are different. So if you think about it, that means that we can compare types, right? If, if we have a value of this type, we know that A and B must be exactly the same. And furthermore, we can cast between them in arbitrary context, right? If we replace F with identity, ID, then we can cast between I, A and B directly, given the value of that type. If we have a list of A, we can cast it to a list of B. And internally, that's going to be just an identity function. Yeah? So why do you need F there? F, F ensures that we cannot do anything else other than return B, uh, rather than return the argument, right? If you wrote 
Yes, f is completely arbitrary. It could be int. Uh, you know, f, uh, f of a equals int. <coughs> or it could be f of a equals a. Or it could be f of a equals identity. Now, it turns out that in Haskell, you can express it in a slightly different way, um, where you can say that you have data is a b, where you have only one constructor, and this constructor tells you that A and B are exactly the same. And then if you pattern match in that, uh, the compiler will be able to convert between the two without any uh, problems. Now, in this talk, we'll assume that you know, everything is pure, total, and very nice, that null doesn't exist, and so on. So Scala is a subset of Scala. I think that Tony, Tony Morris uh, coined the term Scalazy, which basically is like everything except totality. But it will also seem to totality of all functions because otherwise we cannot have this mapping between uh, propositions and types. So, well, first of all, let's talk about how many inhabitants types have. Uh, void is the same as unit. It's just a. Uh, I, I use void because there are certain problems with unit. Uh, with uh, it's the same as nothing. There are certain problems with nothing and implicit resolution in Scala. So I have a a new type over nothing that gives you, you know, the same API, but it actually resolves uh, in implicit. So the number of inhabitants of void or of nothing is zero, right? We cannot construct any, any value of type nothing. We can throw exceptions, but remember that's not allowed because we are not allowed to, you know, we have to be pure and total. Unit has only one inhabitant. A tuple has uh, a product of inhabitant counts of its components. An either you just sum up, um, actually it, sh it should have been, uh, you know, yeah, brackets, around types. Uh, for functions, it's b to the power of a. Why? Because for every single value in a, you have to choose one value in b, right? So you have, you choose, for the first value of a, uh, you choose its target, right? For a second, you do the same, and so on. And so that, that gives you b to the power of a. And for other types, that's not exactly clear, right? So for example, we looked at uh, is. This is a, just a uh, type alias. For type equality, it really depends on what types uh, a and b are, right? If they are the same type, we only have one inhabitant. If they are different types, there are zero inhabitants. And things get progressively trickier with other types. Now, why do we care about type inha uh, inhabitation? <laughs> or why do we care about the number of inhabitants? Well, first of all, uh, if, you think, if you have an, an implicit parameter, there could be many different instances of that implicit parameter, right? So somebody could call your function with, essentially one, one of the promises of type classes is that you always get the same value, right? If, if you ask for a type class, you always get the same instance for the same type, right? So, and this global coherence gives us extra reasoning capabilities, right? So, but if you knew that a certain type had less than uh, or equal to one number of inhabitants, that's basically like a type class, right? For every, you know, if you ask it implicitly, you know that either your code won't compile or it will compile and it will be exactly that one instance. Uh, another nice thing about it is that, well, if we know that we have less than or equal to one inhabitant, 
and we have some uh, complicated expressions that evaluates to type A, and a very simple expression that evaluates to type A. Right? We can replace complicated expression with a simple one. And our program will have exactly the same behavior. So in homotopy type theory and then type theory in general, I guess, uh, there is actually a term for types that have less than or one uh, inhabitant, uh, less than or equal to one inhabitant. Uh, and, it's called, and they're called propositions, or mere propositions. What it means is that every single, if you take a pair of inhabitants, X and Y, they're going to be the same. This, this type, um, this is um, written in like type theory notation, but it basically means that every single, every two inhabitants are exactly the same. In Scala, it's a little bit harder to define. Uh, so, you know, just use your imagination, right? Uh, if you, you take an X of type A, a Y of type A, and then you return and prove that those two values are the same. Now, in, in Leibniz, I actually have this type class defined. However, I have to use certain tricks in order to actually make it work. You could use uh, singleton types, but that doesn't really work well because singletons uh, don't really work well in Scala. Okay, so w what kind of, what are, are those propositions? Well, it's every type class. It's void because it has zero inhabitants. Unit, um, equality, type equality. Type type typing it also has only one inhabitant because if two types are in a subtyping relation, then it's just an identity function. And if they aren't, then there are zero inhabitants. Singletons and also you know, pairs or anything that is isomorphic to um, you know, like a tuple of propositions. And something called bracket types. Now bracket types, is a bracket type is something that hides away the computational context of a type, right? So if I have a bracket of int, that means that I know that there is some int, but I, but I don't give you a, an explicit instance of it, right? So if I have, a, for example, a bracket of exists x such that, um, Hmm. Let's say I tell you that there is such an x that 2x equals n, right? But I don't give you the exact x. Now, we know that the number is even, but you don't know the exact uh, factor of it, right? Now, and we can also say, well, what, what's the number of inhabitants of this bracket type, right? Um, well, it's, it's zero if type A is uninhabited, and otherwise it's one. Because essentially there is no computational context. You only know that there is some value, but you don't know what that value is. And another very important property is that we can lift functions that go from A to a bracket the type of B. So if you can prove that B is inhabited given an A, you can also prove that given, just given, uh, a proof that type A is inhabited. Now, turns out that we can define this in Scala. Although we have to use, if you look at it, right, there is this interesting function on top that takes an A to void and then, or rather it takes a function from A to void and returns a void, right? Where void is basically nothing. Think of it as nothing. So what is it, let's go back to propositions as types. What exactly 
does this expression represent? What is, what is not A? As you can see, it's, it's not on the table yet. Any, any suggestions? How can we represent negation of something, something in logic? Or, or what, are, or what are the ways to represent negation? Hmm? Yes, complement. Yes, right. So we use implication to bottom. So not A is the same as A to bottom. Because if I can prove from A, uh, if I can prove falsehood from A, that means that A was false itself, right? You cannot prove a false proposition from a true one. Oh, that's just A to void. Or A to nothing, right? So this, uh, this function is actually not not A, right? So we have A to void, that's not A. And on the outside, we have another um, function to void, which means it's not not A. And it, it turns out that, you know, this type looks funny because uh, obviously <clears throat> he cannot run this function, right? He, he cannot ever supply it. Uh, well, I guess he could supply it with, a, with an identity function, right? If he knew that void, uh, if, if you have an instance of it, right? Well, if you somehow manage to construct an identity and pass it to that function, you'll get back void, right? So if A is the same as void, and you somehow manage to construct an identity be, uh, or a function between A and void, then you would get back void. That means that there are no, if A is, if you have the, an instance of this uh, type, then A must be inhabited. Because if it isn't, then you can get a void. Right? Because if it isn't inhabited, then you can uh, find an identity function between A and void, call it, call run, and get void back. And then suddenly everything, you, you've derived falsehood. So that's impossible. At least uh, as long as you're in this total pure world. And it turns out, what's, what's even more interesting is it turns out that this um, type is actually, actually forms a monad. It's a little bit tricky to write this one, but it's just, uh, you know, type golf. You just fill in empty places with uh, correct types and it, everything works out. And using this type, you can actually prove things like Well, not exactly proof, but you can come up with an instance of inhabited A or not, uh, well, not A, A to void. So we can actually show that um, law of excluded middle is true. The only problem is that you cannot, you cannot get A or a to void out of it. If you if you look at the signature, there is no way you can get an A out of this type. You you could try to run it and supply something that you know uh, stores A into a mutable variable, but as you you know as you remember, that's against the rules. In the pure total world, you cannot do that. And furthermore, there are some problems with that. If you actually try to do that. Uh, sometimes it's nice to force this structure, basically to assert that something is inhabited. And if you assert that something is inhabited, you don't explicitly provide a, a value. And so whatever tricks you use are going to fail in, in such case, right? 
Okay, now I went over type equality. As you can see here is uh, the only possible instance of this type. I mean, you, you can, since we're working in Java, you can actually create another instance and add some members, but they're not gonna be accessible through the original type, right? Here's a more interesting one, subtyping. So, the type on top, it tells you that whatever covariant f you give it, you can convert between f of a and f of b, right? So for example, with lists, that's gonna work, right? Because lists are covariant. So if you supply list as f, you can convert between a and b. But for something like predicate, which is contravariant, is, is everyone familiar with covariant, uh, covariance, contravariance in Scala? Okay, so uh, if you supply something that, that is contravariant, that's not gonna work, right? Um, so if you supply an identity, which is covariant, then you can cast between A and B. And it's a, essentially upcasting. Up and furthermore, we have only one instance. It's a little bit trickier to see that there is only one, but if, if you think about it, well, you have to produce F of B. The only thing that you have is F of A. So the only functions that you can possibly supply here is an identity function. Now, a little bit more propositions as types. If we want to say that something does not equal to something else, we can just say that if somebody gives us A equals B, then we'll be able to derive falsehood. Right. And Leibniz also defines a couple of other types. First of all, we have comparable and, incom uh, comparable and incomparable types. Uh, comparable types are those that are in a subtyping relation. So it's either A is below B or B is below, oh, or B is a subtype of A. And incomparable types are those that are not in any kind of subtyping relation. And we can define other things like strict subtyping. And oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that uh, equality and subtyping relations, they form categories, right? Because essentially if you know that A is equal to B and B is equal to C, there is actually a way to compose them and using only that function subst. So maybe later I'll, I'll show how, how it's done in the code because it's actually a lot of you know, type uh, manipulations and no as instance of anywhere. Wait, so a semi-category is a category without an identity so it's essentially, you have, uh, you have morphisms, but you don't have an identity morphism, right? Sometimes they are called semi-groupoids, but I think that semi-category makes a little bit more sense because otherwise you would have category extending semi-groupoid and then groupoid extending from category. And then we can form even more complicated things, right? Well, what is a constant type constructor? A constant type, a constant type constructor is one where every single type f of a is equal to every other f of b, right? So essentially f of a does not depend on a. So it's always the same type. 
in, in Scala, we only have uh, constant type constructors as type lambdas. So if you define type foo of a is int, right, no matter what kind of a you supply to, it's always going to be int. So that's our definition using uh, proposition says types. And injective type constructors, they have the opposite property, right? For any two types, well, if you know that f of a is the same as f of b, then you automatically can infer that a is the same as b. But another way of saying that, if you know that a does not equal to b, then you can derive from that that f of a does not equal uh, to f of b. Yes. And we have some others, right? Because, you know, there, there are a lot of different definitions that you can come up with. Now, these are written in a slightly different notation. Uh, less than or equal means regular subtyping. Um, tilde me means uh, equality. This is uh, incomparable types. Yeah. Uh, and less means strict subtyping. So if you look at it, you know, like strict, strict covariant uh, is, is the type, the type class where if you know that A is a strict subtype of B, then you can prove that F of A is a strict subtype of F of B. So strictly covariant types cannot be constant, right? Because for constant, for constant type constructors, you would have f of a equals f of b. But here, we are explicitly saying that there will be proofs that f of a is not, does not equal to f of b. And all of those type classes are defined in Leibniz. You can find them in Leibniz.variants, if you like. Now, when working, while working on this project, I realized that Scala type system is actually not good enough. It doesn't have a lot of necessary axioms. So I'll, I'll go through a couple of this, but here are some things that I call phantom parametricity. Essentially, uh, the, the axioms um, that, I, that I need are all rela uh, related to the fact that a type constructor cannot inspect or introspect, uh, you know, it cannot look into the types that you supply to it. So it can only use it in the positive negative position, but it can never like compute a function of the input type. It can never match on it. So I call it type, uh, type class or type constructor par parametricity. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the right term for it is. So here's an example, right? We know that f of a is the same as f of b. And at the same time, we know that A and B are different types. And from that, we can prove that F of X equals to F of Y for any possible pair of types. So what that means is that, well, let's see. First of all, we know that there are different types. Okay, that means that if F of A is the same as F of B, then it must be constant functor. A constant uh, t uh, type constructor. Because in Scala, there is no other way this could happen. If you have a, a data type, right? Um, if you have a, like a class taking a type A, right? Then if these are two different types, then this two would be different as well. So it must be a constant, uh, constant type constructor, and therefore we can just assert that f of x equals uh, to f of y. Similarly, if we see that a and b are different types, and a is a subtype of b, and we see that f of a is also a subtype of b. And we'll also have to, you know, uh, then we, we can derive that f of x is, uh, is a subtype of f of y, given x is a subtype of y. A little bit more complicated, but basically what it means is that if you know that your type 
uh, type constructor is strictly covariant, then you get a subtyping relation. Now, why is it not? Uh, da, 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 da. Now, why, why did I not put uh, strict subtyping here? It turns out that you can actually prove that this, uh, well, if, you, if, uh, if uh, f is a constant type constructor, then it's also fine, right? Then we know that f of x is the same as f of y, therefore f of x is a subtype of f of y. And so on. I, I had to add five different parametricity axioms. They're all, you know, they're all fairly natural. You could write them as well without, um, you know, as long as you know what you want, right? They, they sort of like follow naturally. Okay, now let's talk about classical logic. Before we talked uh, about propositions as types, but in classical logic, there are certain axioms that don't seem to translate well to programming languages. So for example, uh, in, in intuitionistic logic, uh, or, or to intuitionistic logic. So for example, in classical logic, there is a law of double negation where if you have not not a, then you can derive a, right? So from not not a follows a. In programming languages, that would be a function like this. Can everybody see this or should I? So it's a function that takes a double negated a and returns an A. Now, you can try to write such a function yourself, but you know, you'll, you'll realize that it's absolutely impossible. There is no way to take it out, right? And so, but sometimes we might want to do that, nevertheless, because it simplifies a lot of proofs. And so, uh, in Leibniz, I actually have for some of the types, we can actually, we not only know the unique instance, right? But we can construct it at any, any point in time, right? Uh, so for example, equality between types, right? If we know, if we know that that type is inhabited, if we have a proof of it, a double negation just means inhabited here. If we know that A is inhabited, or like a, a equals to B is inhabited, then we can just construct A equals to B using, using as instance of, using type coercion. And that simplifies a lot of proofs because we have this very powerful classical logic that we can use. And in classical logic, um, you know, as long as at the end of our proof, we construct uh, one of the types that satisfies this type class, we can automatically go from double negation to the actual type. Okay, now let me go to the code and I'll show you how exactly you can, I'll show you some combinators that, uh, on those types that I described. Okay, so over here we have our equality type is A of and B. And here we have our, the, the only undefined function in this type. Everything else is defined in terms of this function. So first of all, we have coercion. How do we coerce between two types? Well, we just supply identity function to substitution. 
substitution under identity is just coercion. Composition is a little bit trickier and a little bit more interesting. But if you have A equals to B, which is AB here, and you have B equals to C, right? We, we construct a new type constructor, construct a new type constructor, uh, that you know, A equals to some type B, right? And then when we do the substitution over here, essentially we replace A with B in this expression, or rather B with C in this expression, right? So we pass it AB, so it's A equals to B, right? Let's, let's write it out, because otherwise it's... So we have AB of type A equals to B. And we have BC of type B equals to C. Right? Now we do substitution using BC. And supply it. So, uh, is everybody familiar with kind projector plugin? Yes? No? Yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to write it in, a, in Dotty syntax then. So, any, everyone familiar with Dotty syntax for type lambdas? I think, I think fewer people will be familiar with Dotty. Just write a type alias. Uh, well, I want to. Well, well, okay. Okay, so, you know, we, ha we have the type alias over there, right? Now, I, I want to explicitly write out bc.subst of f, right? So bc dot subst of f is going to be a function that takes a of b and returns a of c. If you if you carefully you know think about it, this is a uh, a equals equals B. Now remember that subst takes F of A, uh, F of, in this case, B to F of C, right? So you substitute B and then C and you get from A to B, A equals B to A equals C. So that's composition and so on. Um, you can do flip. So it's not only a category, it's also a groupoid. You can prove things like this. So, you know, if you know that A is the same as B, then you also know that F, for any F, F of A is the same as F of B. And so on. Now, this part of the library allows it to do things in types of way, right? Because coercions can be just replaced, you know, if you need to coerce some, somewhere, then you probably just need a value that uh, proves that the first type is equal to the second type. Now, uh, this part of the library is a little bit different. Uh, is anyone familiar with uh, shapeless not equals? thing. Okay, so <laughs> I'll, I'll explain how it's defined first. Um, so it, does everybody know how in Scala you have low prior, uh, like different priority of uh, uh, implicits? Okay, so the idea behind uh, inequality in, in shapeless is that we first, we want our implicits to be ambiguous if, t if two types are the same and succeed if they're different, right? So essentially shapeless defines like three implicits, two of them 
succeed if types are the same and one of them succeeds uh, if types are different. And so if they're the same, then you have uh, ambiguity. If they're different, then it returns you a value of this uh, type, un, you know, not non-equal, right? However, if you do that in a generic context, like in the first line, then the compiler is going to look at those two types, A and B, and it's going to say, well, they look different to me at this point in time, right? Because they are different names. They are different abstract types. However, if we supplied, let me just change the slide. If we supply two equal types to this function, it would still return us uh, inequality between int and int, int, which doesn't make any sense. So, ideally, we should only compare types when we know that we can compare them, right? Because only when we can decide equality between types, then we should compare them for you know inequality. Only when that is decidable. Uh, in, usually, equality is decidable uh, in the sense that a certain subset of, like you cannot always decide that two types are equal, but if you see that they're equal, if Scala C sees that they're equal, then they are equal, right? However, that's not the case with inequality. Sometimes, uh, at least in, as it is defined in shapeless. So be careful with a shapeless inequality operator. Instead, uh, in Leibniz, I have this thing called type ID, which closes the universe of all of types, and it gives you a description of a type. If you compare two descriptions and they are the same, then you know that two types are the same. If you compare that descri uh, those descriptions and they are different, then the types are different. In some sense, it's like get class, right? Except doesn't violate the parametricity and, you know, generally uh, is a, a little bit nicer. Now, the way it's defined, it doesn't really matter. Uh, there is a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, internal details. But in the end, it gives you this method, compare, which allows it to compare two types and then it returns either inequality or inequality. So you can actually compare two types at runtime, potentially. And finally, uh, is anyone familiar with quantified context in Haskell? Okay, this is uh, this is the last slide. So um, essentially, sometimes we want a, a proof, or we want to ask for an um, for say monoid of f of x for every single instanti instantiation of uh, f of x uh, for every single instantiation of x. W well, it's currently impossible in Scala. H how do you do that? Do you like use uh, existentials there? That's not going to work. Do you use, you know, like if you write implicit f of type f of x, how, how, how do you specify that it should be polymorphic in x, right? There is no way. So. It turns out that in Scala we can actually use a like a trick in order to actually be able to derive this. So in Leibniz, I use a certain macro. Uh, although n now I know that you can write it without a macro, that takes a hidden type that is not available, uh, that is not visible to any, you know, to anybody outside. It puts it inside of f, so it, it, it asks for f of some hidden type. And if it succeeds, right, if it, if it manages to resolve that f of hidden type implicitly, then you know that the instance that you get actually applies to any kind of type, right? Because, you know, if f of hidden type, you have a, you have a f of hidden type and somehow somebody constructed uh, that type, you know, that they couldn't have looked inside of hidden, right? They could have only looked at f. Uh, 
And so that's, that's for all. Um, and then I also have implies, which does something similar, but it checks whether B can be derived implicitly in a context where A is available. But it doesn't require an A. If, if there is no A, this, uh, this um, implies AB will, will you, know, you know, if you have a proof, say, for example, you've come up with a proof from void, you can prove anything, right? Because from falsehood, you can prove anything. If you come up with an implicit that takes an implicit void, well, that shouldn't succeed. However, an implication will still succeed. Right, if you ask for an implicit from void to, uh, to any other type class. So that's, uh, there are certain use cases for it uh, in Haskell. Uh, and you know, we couldn't have done that in Scala before. So I, I don't know. Like, for example, in uh, type class, uh, type level cats, they actually use monoid K of F, which is actually just a monoid for any argument of F. So the way it's implemented is essentially um, def algebra monoid for f of a and a here. So it's basically just a type that tells you, well, if you have a monoid k for f, then for any type a, you can produce a monoid of f of a. But that's exactly what we have here, uh, without an extra type, just a combination of uh, for all and monoid. So uh, that's about it. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, mostly, mostly Leibniz is all about proposition sys types. And you have to understand that proposition, uh, propositions do not have any computation context, right? So you cannot really compute with them. You cannot really, you know, like if you, if you know that something is true, you, you don't really have any, 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 it's not a computation, right? So if you know that there is some x such that n is 2x, then you only know that x is you know, if it's, if it's a proposition, then you only know that n is even, but you don't know x. However, this allows us to stay, you know, above the water level and, uh, you know, just use, like, all of the code you write with Leibniz is going to type check, right? So, and you know that then it's correct. Uh, if you use as instance of, that might not be the case. Uh, any questions? Yeah. So, um, since a lot of this is like reminding me of like stuff like with Coke and here and, yes. and so forth. So, mm -hmm. what's the? I, I didn't. Under, I didn't catch. Or I didn't hear what the uses of Leibniz is. It meant there's like an underlying. So, name? okay. Uh, what are the uses? Well, let's say you have a function that takes a type bound. Uh, that takes a type parameter with a type bound. That's not very uh, convenient. Well, I mean, it's convenient as long as it works. However, it infects all of your code, right? Because if you have a generic parameter and it's bounded, then whoever calls that parameter also has to have a bound um, as long as it's generic, assuming, assuming that it's generic. And so it's, it, type bounds tend to infect all of your code. So everywhere you start uh, seeing those type bounds. Um, Personally, I don't think that that's a that's good style. So instead, I prefer to pass uh, implicit evidence. By the way, all of all of those type classes they resolve implicitly as well. So we can ask for implicit covariant list, and it should resolve. 
um, is there actually like some either macros or uh, you know in, in, in some cases it's possible to actually prove that something is covariant um, just using Scala you know Scala C and it, its uh, capabilities so uh, like, right so in that, another place where I, I mostly use like type ID uh, type ID I don't have a, like a particularly good for for it uh, use for it, but uh, if you have a, you can actually have a map from a type to a type class. I know it sounds sketchy, uh, but uh, <laughs> say if you have a, like serialization and it, it's an external library and you need some sort of serializers, uh, but you want to store them based on type because obviously you know maybe you implicitly summon them construct them and then you save them in this map and then later you can read it from a file and using that type ID you can actually find out the exact type it is so I use that uh, and then Leibniz also has its own equality type class which gives you some extra powers so for example if you know that two terms are the same you also know that singleton their singleton types are the same that's not true in Scala Scala doesn't believe that if you do that right uh, however, I know that my code is pure and total and, uh, you know, satisfies parametricity. Therefore, if I can, if I compare two values and I can see that they're the same, that means that, uh, there shouldn't be any way for me to tell that they're different, right? I, I mean, so is every single property of those two values must be the same. It means that if I substitute them in any context, it's still going to be the same. So you can use it to write type safe, like matrix multiplication. So we have two matrices, n by m. One matrix is n by m, and it's expressed in types. Another matrix, m by uh, k, also expressed in types, right? But you don't really know that uh, the types at the end, uh, say you do it uh, at runtime, and you don't really know that uh, the types uh, align properly, right? Per perhaps it's like m, n, whatever, K and L, right? Well, now you can compare uh, a, a witness, like a value of type K and the value of type M. If they're the same, then you get an evidence value of equality between those two singletons. And now we can coerce your matrices to the right shape and then multiply them. Does it make sense? Are you saying that's happening at runtime or compile time? Uh, it could. It can happen at compile time, but you also have an opportunity to do that at runtime. Say you read it from a file, you you get uh, essentially an, two existential types. You don't know what your matrix, the size, you don't know it because it depends on the runtime. But now you have you can compare. Uh, you can compare uh, two values of those types, right? Infers that they're. Um, infers that types properly align. Let me, let me, <laughs> it might be easier if I just show some code instead of. So we have a matrix in M. And we have some sort of function read string Now, ideally, over here, uh, you have to, like, in, inside of here, you have to have some sort of um, evidence for that singleton. So let's say that it's a singleton. You don't really have to provide type bounds, but then uh, in Leibniz, I also have this thing called, uh, that looks like this, and it basically tells you that, hey, n is a, singleton of type n. So we'll do it like this. So we have one end, another end. Uh, now we read them and we can just make them existential, right? Some types. <laughs> 
I mean, it, it's better to have something like for some, uh, I think. But anyway, and and then later on we have like M1 matrix. Oh, M2. Now, in order to multiply them, we need to know that the types align, right? But we don't have that kind of information. And as I said, it's uh, ideally you want something here so that you can refer to it. So you can use for all, or rather, uh, in Leibniz, they have like a thing called exists, right? And it basically tells you, provides you an explicit name for that type, for the type of uh, an existential type parameter, right? And then, essentially what you would do, you would say, hey, I want to compare n to compare m2, uh, n and m here, right? And then I want to match on this. And it's either right of a proof of equality. So this is going to be a proof of, you know, uh, something like this, essentially, M2 and type. Or I have a left, and it's a proof of inequality, right? And then, you know, if they are nickel, then I cannot do, really do anything, right? So in some sense, we get, we, we can get compile time guarantees uh -huh. Like, you know how in dependently typed languages, right? We would just match in both matrices. We would see that the, the uh, types, or rather, you know, sizes are the same, and then we would be able to multiply this, right? This is roughly the same thing. We're, we're not exactly matching on the, on the matrices themselves, but we, we have an op operation that allows us to compare two values and from that infers that their singleton types are the same. Or, I mean, there is a lot more machinery that is required to actually do it sanely. <laughs> uh, I have an example of a vector type implemented. Uh, if I haven't, if I haven't changed it, or uh, is this? Okay, let's go back a few commits. Uh, history. Okay. Yes, yes. And it's different from what uh, Miles showed at, um, you know, like um, essentially using shapeless, you can also have something like that. The difference here, however, uh, is that we can actually recover evidence at runtime, right? So all of those types, like if you have, you know, like sized uh, vector, you can actually find out the value of n at, at runtime. So um, they are not erased, those, uh, you know, um, uh, like values are not erased that appear in types. Alex, mm -hmm. the, um, the implementation of type ID. Yes. Yes. Oh, that would be very easily. Although you would. Um, if anyone is looking for something to do, if somebody did that, that would be really amazing. Because um, in Scala Z deriving, we could use those type IDs to cache the instances of the mm -hmm. type classes and get a huge runtime boost. Yeah, so type ID. Uh, in the PCD, really ever once right. Right, so type ID, is, the way it works is uh, it actually, it has certain limitations right now because uh, it's, it's hard to provide like IDs for all types. Uh, so I only provide them for uh, concrete types that may have singletons as their type parameters. 
So single tons are okay and concrete types are okay. Higher kind of types are okay um, as long as everything is concrete, meaning that everything maps onto like classes or type lambdas that are known. Uh, Yeah, and well, you know, it will need some optimization because right now what it does, uh, it uses a macro, right? It, you know, first checks that your type is concrete and then it recursively, um, you know, does a, like a catamorphism and essentially computes a hash of your type using murmur. Uh, murmur 128, so the probability, prob probability of collision is pretty low. You know, like so low that you probably don't have enough types in order to trigger it. Uh, if anybody wants to make it uh, use SHA-1 or something, that's also fine. Uh, but it's going to incur uh, a, a runtime cost. Because if you have singletons, if you have singletons, then you have to do that at runtime. Uh, if they are not, so there are two types of singletons. There are literals like zero, one, uh, and zero singletons that refer to like a type of a value. Right, so for this to work, you yes. effectively have to work by, at compile time what type I can use. Yes. Like you would lose the performance benefit. Yes. Uh, I, I was just going to use strings, like the compiler's version of the string of, of the type of these individual, which is probably more limiting. The years would support more things, but... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. No, it, it, you would get a performance boost. I mean, uh, most of it can be done in compile time. Like literally almost everything except singletons, right? right? If you, you probably don't have that many singletons. Uh, only singleton part has to be done. Uh, and only when they refer to like a value, then it has to be done at runtime. And that would be done stream users with having singletons. Hmm? It would be done stream users. Mm. Yeah, but uh, you should you should look at the code. It's uh it's actually pretty pretty understandable. <laughs> Although in this part, you know, in macros there are like zero comments. <laughs> so um and and then I use uh, my own equality type class in order, to, so I, I need a way to hash singletons, and so as a result, my equality type class actually has hash, hashable built into it. Um, and for certain reasons, as actually, I think, is the right approach. Although, if anybody wants to know why, uh, yeah, feel free to ask, but otherwise it's uh, going into a little bit too much detail. And, you know, uh, in, in Leibniz, I also have sigma and pi types, but they're not exactly like the same types as in dependent, uh, dependent type theory. Dependently type theory.